This is the Trade to Black podcast special edition here on a Thursday. Great to have everybody in here today. I'm your host, Shad Dales. What are we talking about today? We'll be teed it up yesterday. The CEO of Cureleaf, Matt Darren, joins us to talk about their latest earnings. Some of the big announcements that have happened recently pertaining to Germany, what they mean for the company moving forward. So let's get right into it. Let's welcome in TDR co-host Anthony Burrell. Good to see you. This should be an interesting conversation as we welcome yeah. in the CEO of Cureleaf. So let's get on that. Welcome in, Mr. Darren. Matt Darren, CEO, first time to the podcast. I know it's been a few months since you and I caught up. We were down at the TSX. We were talking about that before we actually started today's podcast. Time flies, but here you are, three months on the TSX, uh, but you had some earnings yesterday. But how are you? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Good to see you again. I can't believe it's been three months since we were in uh, Toronto again. I'm okay with this warmer weather, though. I don't know where you're based out of, but I'm ready for spring. I think there's a lot of people hoping for some announcements Uh we won't get into that because we can't control that. But, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, before we get into these numbers, how do you feel the industry is progressing as a whole here early on in 2024? I think the industry is uh, on a strong trajectory right now. I think uh, 2023 yep. was certainly uh, an interesting year, a year of uh, some challenges. You know, those of us like myself that have been in the industry now uh, for a decade, uh, it's uh, nothing new to, uh, you know, go through some uh, some different challenges, uh, you know. But overall, I think, um, you know, after uh, 2023, we ended the year on a strong note and we're seeing a lot of positivity coming into 2024 with some of the catalysts starting to pop and uh, just overall health of uh, of the market improving. Yeah. Well, let's dive into some of these numbers from yesterday. You reported record revenue of 345.25 million for the fourth quarter of 2023. Earnings per share came in at minus one cent, which was actually above analyst estimates for the quarter. You did report a net loss of 63 million for the quarter, but remain optimistic about your future growth because most of that or most of those who follow the space know that a lot is happening with rumors swirling here in the U.S., the big announcement in Germany, which was two weeks ago. So a lot is happening. So if you had to best describe where you think the biggest opportunity for you as a company here is in 2024, what would it be? So I think there's a number of different opportunities. When I look at the U.S. and, uh, and the domestic market here, uh, I look at a couple of key markets that are really starting to take off. Uh, we're very excited about New York. You know, New York was a uh, you know very talked about market over the last couple of years with a rocky start to uh, trying to get adult use launched. Uh, it took quite a long time, uh, especially for those of us that were uh, in the medical market, ready to serve the adult use market. But Fast forward to today, there's 78 adult use stores open in the market. We expect there to be up to a couple hundred uh, open by the end of the year. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand for regulated product and uh, just, uh, you know, that market's really uh, starting to get some wind at its back. You have some dispensaries that are doing fantastic. We got our first adult use store up in the Hudson Valley open yep. at the beginning of the year. Um, so that's a market that we are uh, really excited about. Um, I would say a number of the markets that you have seen uh, a lot of dispensaries opening up has created a huge wholesale opportunity. Uh, yes. Point New York, yeah. New Jersey, Illinois. You know, these are markets that uh, have been core markets of ours uh, where the wholesale opportunity, while it's all, always been good, uh, was stunted for a while because you had regulatory yeah. delays, capital markets uh, constraints, so a lot of different reasons why you did not have a healthy number of dispensaries open in these states. So, you know, fast forward to where we're at today, New Jersey's got over 100 dispensaries, Illinois has got 185 dispensaries. The wholesale opportunity is coming from that because many of these new entrepreneurs and these new operators do not have vertical product or very little of it. And uh, there's a strong appetite if you have good high quality product uh, to stock those shelves. So those yeah. are a couple areas we're really uh, excited about. Yeah. yeah. One uh, of the first things that I kind of wanted to dive into is the gross margin. I mean, I know you reported 46% in Q4 and then potentially got it up to 50 in Q1. I mean, what are some of the main drivers um, that you see contributing to that margin? And can you kind of uh, dive in a little bit more into the idled capacity that you guys are bringing online? If you give any insight into like the market specifics of that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the biggest driver, as we talked about, is, uh, you know, over the course of 2023, we brought inventories down by about $40 million uh, all told. You know, we had uh, we had inventory, some of that, uh, you know, getting ready for things like New York adult use launches and waiting on a lot of new stores coming online in uh, places like New Jersey. And uh, ultimately, due to delays in that happening, uh, you know, we got to a place where uh, we wanted to needed to move through some inventory. So I think we did a really successful job of doing that in 2023. 
We emphasize selling a lot of that through our own uh, stores, 150 throughout the country. Uh, right size, rebalance the inventory, you know, leaving the year with a very healthy level at about 16% of sales on the inventory side. When you look at the quality of the inventory, uh, we feel very good about where it's at from both flower and formulated products. Um, so a lot of that work was done, but during that period where we brought down the inventory, one of the things that we did was idle capacity. We didn't populate grow rooms. We slowed production of some of those formulated products so that we could rebalance. The impact of that was a hit on gross margin because those unabsorbed costs from those fixed assets, uh, you know, led to uh, you know some erosion in the gross margin. Uh, we have turned that back on. We are back on offense, as we've been uh, saying. Those rooms are back populated. Uh, you know, places like uh, New Jersey that I mentioned, where we're back fully operating and uh, selling product as fast as we can get it uh, on the delivery trucks. New York, where we had built an expansion for adult use, but we weren't populated because there was no stores to sell to in the adult use market. Yeah. Now we've got 28 potential stores to sell into. We're now cranking uh, at our facility in Albany. Uh, Illinois is another example. Illinois was a market where it was uh, very slow to get a lot of these new wholesale accounts open up. And even when they do open, I think one thing it's important to recognize, it takes time for these stores to ramp. They're not yeah. In their first number of months, you know, making monster orders typically. So it just takes time to grow with that. So Illinois is another market where we uh, idled some capacity. We're now, um, you know, back close to fully operational there. So the impact of that getting to really closer to full absorption uh, on those is what, uh, you know, a big driver of uh, how we're, uh, you know, targeting that 50% margin. So the other elements of that is just pricing in general. You did see a lot yeah. of price compression in many different markets. Uh, there's certainly elements of that that are still out there in the markets that have plenty of supply, but by and large, we're seeing um, you know that uh, pressure has uh, eased uh, in a bunch of different markets, and I think our ability to strategically promote and discount and uh, all those different things is uh, allowing us to gain some gross margin points as well. Yep. You, and then speaking, oh god, Chad. I was going to say, like you said, you're seeing like easing markets as far as uh, price compression. Do you want to maybe elaborate a little bit on that, like as to what you're seeing and what markets? Sure. Yeah. So like Connecticut's an example. Connecticut has had, uh, you know, was one of the, uh, you know, positive markers in 2023 with the adult use launch. You know, Connecticut is underserved in terms of product availability for the adult use market there. Um, so there, that's been a market uh, where prices were always pretty strong and uh, they continue to be, um, you know, even stronger uh, as well. I think you've seen in um, some of the other Northeast markets as well, um, where you had seen some major prices decline. Take New York for an example, where that medical market was really starting to uh, stagnate there, waiting for adult use. And now that adult use is happening, uh, you're seeing prices increase, uh, you know, some there as well. So those are a couple examples. With, you know. with, with markets like New York, I mean, Carol, if you guys have brands with pricing power, Grassroots, Select, um, do you see that being a predominantly wholesale market, predominantly retail market, or kind of just like a wait and see approach and see really what you can scale into and what gets traction as far as those sides of the business? Yeah. So ultimately, we see it as a wholesale market. You're going to have yeah. ultimately, uh, you know, it could be a couple thousand doors in uh, New York ultimately. Yeah. Over the course of years, and uh, we're only going to have three adult use stores uh, in the uh, in the state. So we have our one in the Hudson Valley open. It's doing very well. Um, you know that uh, so that's off to a positive start. We've got two more that we can open that uh, you know that we're citing that we want to make sure we're picking A plus locations because uh, you can only have three. So the retail is not going to be bad. I think those stores are going to be super high volume adult use stores uh, if you look at it on a national average. But certainly the opportunity is on the wholesale side to be able yeah. to go serve the market uh, with all of these new dispensaries that are opening up that if you have indoor flour, if you have high quality flour, infused flour, which is uh, you know one of the trends that we're seeing really take off in a lot of different markets that we're excited about, and then good quality formulated products. Uh, we see a lot of demand uh, you know, for it in, uh, in New York, and there's gonna be lots of brands. You, know, you see a lot of the West Coast brands, you see a lot of people that are now excited about the New York market that has set up shop, yeah. um, but there's gonna be enough business to go around in that state. You, and you speaking speaking about brands, I mean, we saw a couple of the other MSOs start to cite trends of consumers graduating from value to mid-priced brands. Are you seeing that within your portfolio? And if you are, is it in markets such as Florida um, or, or such as New York? So I would say we are seeing some of that, some of that major pressure where some of that discretionary income was limited and people were coming into the, to the dispensary 
with you know thirty forty dollars to spend uh, yeah. you know and it was bringing down average ticket value that was a dynamic that was taking place uh, to some degree in some markets uh, last year we have seen that some side some side some I will say the value category continues to be in very high demand uh, our fine yeah. brand that we launched in eleven states uh, selling large you know really great quality flour um, but in larger denominations at a great price uh, you know that's something that we continue to see a lot of customers coming in and uh, and asking for but by and large I think we are seeing uh, you know some improvement on average tickets um, and just overall again like you got different segments of the customer we have some that uh, are continuing to want to only focus on premium. And they're coming in, and whether it's our liquid diamonds, uh, you know, unique vapes, or you know, the infused flower, which sells at a higher price point, uh, lots of demand for that, and lots of consumers that are excited to come, uh, you know, buy that. But I will say some of that pressure on, you know, that we talked about in some prior quarters, uh, you know, has improved. Hmm. I know you and Boris outlined to me back in December when I saw you guys in person, um, the, going back to the whole wholesale market in New York City. Since then, like. Are you seeing a lot of mo momentum as to how they're cleaning up that market right now that presents opportunity for the legal market with such as yourselves? You know, it's early days, I would say. I think yeah. on the positive side, you have legal, you know, card stores and other new dispensaries uh, that are getting open in the city and in other parts of the state that are doing really well. And I think yeah. the more that people figure out that they can go to a legal store and get safe product and a ton of different options and uh, from a lot of different brands uh, and that awareness builds where they're comparing that experience to some of the smoke shops and some of the uh, convenience stores and other places that they were buying uh, who knows what from. Um, I think that uh, momentum is starting to happen. It's going to take a lot more education and a lot more uh, just word of mouth to get out. And there's still, you know, a ton of uh, stores out there in New York City that are selling uh, illegal product. And uh, we've seen some enforcement improve. There's certainly a lot of media attention on it. The governor's come out uh, on a number of different occasions and, uh, you know, really kind of uh, put pressure on the regulator to get and, and law yep. enforcement to get serious about crackdowns. Um, there's ways to do it. We've seen it done before. They can go after landlords. Uh, uh, you know, they can make it painful to uh, operate uh, in a legal store. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see a little more will, a little more focus, um, but it's going to take time. But I think the biggest yeah. thing is getting more legal stores open. Um, and that that's yeah. what's going to take a bite out of the illicit market over time is when you have legal stores open. I think it's pretty cool. You see what's going on in New York. You have a lot of local stores, a lot of very uh, unique entrepreneurial. It looks a little bit different than what you're seeing in some of the other markets. It's got a very New York vibe to it. And depending on the borough you're in or the part of the state you're in, uh, it's very, it, you know, it's, it's unique. And so I think that cannabis culture coming out of New York is starting to come into the regulated market, uh, you know, which yeah. is going to be a great thing. Yeah, there are a couple there. Last time I was in Manhattan, there was actually a couple of, of adult use dispensaries on the that were legal uh, licensed and the brand mix and some of the some of the products you could see had that New York touch to them, kind of like some of the products you see in Florida. Um, it was pretty, pretty interesting. And then talking about opening up new stores, I know in the call you guys have mentioned you have two um, two dispensaries in Ohio that are currently active, building out three with plans to up to the max of eight once adult use um, rolls around. And I think you forecasted a 50 to 50 to 60 million dollar capex spend in 2024. Where is that capex um, going to be going? I'm assuming strategically key U.S. markets. And does that capex spend include Cure Relief International um, in those numbers? Yeah. So it does include international. So that is a, okay. a capex number for the, for the global company. Um, the big categories of CapEx that we're looking at for 2024, it starts with Florida. So Florida, we are gearing up for uh, hopeful, successful, uh, first of all, getting on the ballot, which, uh, you know, we expect either to hear by April 1st, or if we don't hear, then it'll be on the ballot, uh, uh, you know, by uh, in, in November. So kind of gearing up for, uh, you know, the hopeful, uh, you know, success of that. And so, you know, we have been under expansion in, in Florida, continuing to build out more capacity and opening new stores. Um, and so we, we put a little bit of that on pause, waiting to see that the it was going to hit the ballot. Now that uh, it appears that uh, hopefully we're heading that trajectory, uh, we're planning to continue to add, uh, you know, more capacity in the Florida market. So that's going to be a big part of the spend as well as, uh, you know, more stores in that market to ultimately get up to somewhere around 85 over the course of uh, the next period of time uh, as adult use okay. hits. Some of that will trail into 25 as we get closer to the adult use launch. A um, couple other markets that we're going to be spending some CapEx, New York, 
getting some of these stores open, uh, the new adult use stores, Ohio, as you talked about, uh, you know, getting some of those stores open, and then some other smaller spend on things like automation and, uh, and that that, uh, you know, we want to continue to invest in, because that's one of the ways that we are bringing down our uh, cost of goods and improving margins. Yeah. Okay. And then one thing that I picked up on the call, I know that Boris had mentioned that the European, purely international, this was the first quarter that it achieved positive adjusted EBITDA um across the business unit so i mean congratulations there what yeah. how, how do you foresee this the, the the eu kind of playing out because i mean we talk about germany a lot Curelief international is much more than germany you had uk come online from an edibles perspective portugal um there was an operational highlight in there as well i mean german market's great but how do you see the the, the entire eu i guess growing at large um via Curelief international yeah, so it's interesting. It, it's um, you know something we've been working at for a couple of years now, and we're I think the the first ones of the U.S. companies to see the opportunity in Europe and uh, invest yeah. originally in the uh, EMAC transaction and building on from there. So, look, I think um, you know Germany. We believe Germany is going to be that big domino that you yeah. Know, we expect to fall that is going to cascade into a number of other European countries that uh, begin to embark on programs, uh, you know, that look probably something quasi similar to what they're, uh, they're doing in Germany. And so um, okay. it's a, it's, it's got a lot of benefits compared to the US, the fact that we can uh, centrally grow and manufacture in Portugal, um, and have this kind of global supply chain uh, uh, that we can then, you know, import into these com countries, uh, uh, you know, like Germany, and now Poland and the UK, it's center uh the ability to get to profitability and to uh ultimately get to true scale looks a lot different than the state-by-state -state u.s business that yeah in the uh yeah thank so, yeah exactly. that's an understatement for the day so um but uh so that's pretty exciting so we expect germany to really be the kickoff to a much broader uh legalization uh liberalization of cannabis throughout europe that's going to involve regulated programs uh you know the wall look different because every country's got kind of their own uh mindset on how this is gonna to look but yeah. uh we're very excited about it. Uh, Germany is the big, the, the big one. 80 million people today. There's something like probably 300,000 patients uh, in the medical program. But it's been a medicine of last resort uh, that has been challenging yeah. to get. But there is a huge backlog of patients that have not been able to legally access cannabis in Germany um, that are waiting for this moment uh, where it gets removed from this narcotics yeah. list becomes a medicine that's available, gets sold through pharmacies and online and all these different, uh, you know, methods. And, uh, you know, we think over time it's going to take, it'll take a minute to ramp, um, but it's just going to be a, a absolutely massive market. Um, and then you've got markets that are opening up. Poland is a market nobody was talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were very excited to uh, announce an acquisition of a company, uh, Canfermed, in Poland uh, uh, recently. And uh, that's a country of 40 million people adjacent to Germany. A uh, lot of opportunity there. Um, you know, the barriers to entry into Europe and some of the uh, regulatory uh, timelines to get products registered, strains registered, a lot of those barriers uh, take years to, uh, to get I over. Bet. Yeah, um, you know, that's another thing that we're excited about. We think the first, you know, we, we learned about being first movers in the U.S. over the last decade and getting your footprint and getting solidified and building your brands in these markets. And I think we're taking the same approach in Europe. And the benefit of Europe is I think there's going to be higher barriers to even get into for people. I did not realize well, there are key learnings. There are yeah. key learnings that you're taking from that U.S. footprint and tr bringing them overseas. Um, into uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we've made, uh, certainly learned a lot of lessons, some painful, uh, over the course of, uh, the last decade, but, uh, to think about, uh, you know, all the experience we have, um, the innovation that we've done, our product portfolio, you know, we were the first company to legally be able to bring strains over, uh, registered, to, you know, into Europe. So our ability to build kind of this global portfolio of high quality strains that we breed that are unique to us that are available, whether it's Germany or States in the U us or other countries throughout the world we think is pretty unique nobody else is doing uh you know the same model um and you know many other lessons about how do you go to market in uh in these different uh countries but i will say one, one of the real uh, analogs that we're seeing which is similar to what we've done in the us is that you know every market's different um you have to yeah. customize your go-to-market offering, your products, your sales uh, approach, all those things to tailor to the market. What we're doing in New York looks different than what we're doing in Arizona, for example. Same thing in the European countries. And I think we're taking that mentality in terms of uh, you know, being able to be entrepreneurial, decentralized, 
nimble yet have this kind of global infrastructure and scale as well. So when speaking, I, I don't, I don't want to jump back to the US or go ahead, Chad. I was going to say, like, I couldn't help but notice, like, it's almost like you got a grin on your face each time we bring up, you know, the Germany and the European market. If you had to point out one thing when it comes to misunderstanding uh, or misconceptions uh, about the European market that investors here in North America don't really understand, what would it be? I would say the total address addressable market. People don't realize that the total addressable market of Europe is, you know, multiples of what it is in the U.S. I think, uh, you know, Americans uh, have a myopic view that, uh, you know, the uh, the cannabis industry is, uh, you know, kind of really headquartered in the U.S. And it certainly has been, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, thirty billion dollar legal market uh, that we have today. But I think if you look out three, five, ten years into the future. Uh, yes. you know, one of the things that gets us super excited is that uh, this is truly a global phenomenon. And uh, the fact that uh, cannabis is being legalized for medicinal purposes, for uh, adult use purposes uh, throughout the world uh, is really, really exciting. And, uh, you know, look, Europe feels a little bit different. I, I say in a, in a lot of ways, Europe feels like the U.S. five years ago. It's very yeah. medically oriented, yeah. which we're excited about. Curly's roots are in medical health and wellness. That's where we got our start. You know, we continue to believe that the medicinal side of cannabis, even in an adult use world, uh, you know, is still at the core of what we do and things that we're passionate about yeah. and, uh, you know, feeling really, really positive about the impact we're making on people's lives using cannabis as an alternative to painkillers and, uh, and other uh, narcotics and that. And I think that's really at the forefront in Europe, um, you know, the medicinal research going on there, things that we're doing um, in the UK are really well beyond what we've been able to do in the US. And so I think Europe's gonna continue to be, you know, it's kind of been this delayed catalyst that people have been talking about Germany for a long time and uh, and that now it's actually happening. And so uh, kind of like New York where people talked about it for a long time, now it's happening, kind of same thing in Germany. Hmm. So is, is there a point in time where you think that the EU could actually outpace the US in terms of revenue and growth? Um, what, 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 when looking at the numbers for Curaleaf? I think over time, that is a definite possibility. And, and I'm not even limiting it to Europe per se. I mean, right now we are focused yeah. on Europe because Germany and the UK, those two countries combined of 120, you know, or 140 million people um, is such an opportunity and there's so much white space there. Um, and we have such strong market positioning. Uh, you know, we have about 50% of the patients uh, in yeah. the UK. You know, we they don't publish uh, market share data in Germany, but we it's somewhere about 25% or so. Um, we have so much opportunity right in those two markets. And then when you add in places like Poland and, uh, and some of the other markets that we're in, there's a lot of meat on that bone for us to go attack right now. But I think yeah. the global opportunity outside of the U.S. Uh, in time uh, is going to be extremely material for us. And I think every quarter and every year that we're progressing forward, uh, it's going to become a, a bigger part of our business. That's great. It's the TDR Trader Black podcast on with Curaleaf CEO Matt Darren, along with Anthony Vrell. Question from Hal Abraham Abrahams, who writes, ask Matt, is Germany really going to go through on April 1st? Feedback from that? So we'll know in a couple of weeks. I think uh, I was very excited to see the uh, you know Bundestag, the lower house, uh, you know really vote in a big majority. I think it was 407 to 226 uh, in favor of moving this Pillar One program forward. Uh, we're going to hear on uh, March 22nd, uh, I believe it is, uh, about uh, you know kind of moving it forward. So I think we're hopeful for that date. If uh, if not, then it's going to be uh, you know very close to thereafter. Uh, you know we expect, but we'll know more in a couple of weeks. Another question, so, what day and time will rescheduling be announced? Just kidding. <laughs> Not to answer that one. <laughs> Let me get my yeah. uh, magic eight ball here. See if I can uh, yeah. find an answer. So. so I hate to bring it up, but I got to ask tax strategy. Um, I mean, any any light you could shed as to what, it, what if anything, um, Curaleaf is doing to leverage the tax strategy that we saw with, uh, with, with your peers in Trulief? Sure. So as we mentioned on the earnings call yesterday, we're certainly taking a very close look at it. We got uh, tax advisors and accountants and everybody that are really, uh, you know, taking a strong look at it. Uh, we don't have a position yet. We're doing the due diligence, uh, clearly closely watching uh, what's going on. And I expect, uh, you know, around the time of our Q1 earnings call, uh, we'll have, uh, you know, kind of more to say about our, what our position is. Uh, there was some some uh, news in the media uh, saying talking about uh, protests and that. That's not I the see, case. Yeah. You know, we're, we're paying our taxes. Uh, we're going to continue to do so, but uh, it's incumbent on us to understand all the different, uh, you know, positions and strategies. And we're certainly taking a very hard look at it uh, because the 280E tax has, uh, you know, just been so incredibly punitive, punitive and unfair um, to this industry and to the yeah. extent 
opportunities to uh, mitigate it. Uh, there's no bigger financial catalyst for our industry than uh, not being subject to this tax. It's going to change the entire yeah. face of the industry and uh, anything we can do to, uh, you know, legally be able to uh, get there, uh, you know, we're going to certainly strongly consider. That's an understanding. I know we talk, I know we talk about catalysts a lot and with your industry leading footprint, I just got to ask what market excites you more, Ohio, New York, or Florida? in terms of growth prospects? Wow, you know, I, I have three kids. It's like, <laughs> I have to pick uh, which of my children uh, <laughs> like the best. But, uh, you know, from a straight dollars and cents standpoint, uh, I go with Florida, yeah. yeah. I mean, Florida, uh, I, you know, is likely to be the largest legal market, uh, you know, in the United States. Uh, today it's $2 billion. Uh, you know, it's easy, I think, uh, 3X, uh, you know, over time. Yeah. It'll be 2X to start and then probably get to that level between the 22 million residents and growing um, yeah. as well as uh, you know 135 or so million tourists a year uh, you know that's the market that I think is uh, is you know probably the most exciting and you look at the the market share positioning and uh, just the opportunity to continue to expand with as many dispensaries as you choose to open and uh, and that it's really unique and I think uh, you know those uh, those companies that have kind of set roots in Florida are uh, you know going to be happy they did uh, you know hopefully come uh, November after the election so yeah but, I, but I, I would not sleep on New York either I really think um, you know there was so much skepticism you regarding can't. Due to the delays, due to the illicit market that has been thriving beyond anybody's, uh, you know, belief. But I do think that pendulum is swinging back. And as the yes. use market rolls out, after you get to 200, 300, 500 legal dispensaries throughout the state and you have legal distribution, you have more supply of safe, quality tested products and consumers begin to see the difference between going to a legal dispensary and what they're purchasing versus uh, a smoke shop selling whatever they're selling. Uh, I think that market is uh, also going to be met. And that, that's what gets us uh, you know, so excited about the size of these catalysts. We didn't even talk about places like Pennsylvania uh, you know, that are on the horizon as well. Ohio is going to be a great market. And so there's still a lot of catalysts uh, you know, in the U.S. that's going to, I think, fuel a lot more growth to come. Well, we saw a, 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 a cure relief down in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, it's, uh, I know. Oh. Fort Lauderdale's, uh, you know, been tough on the uh, on the zoning side, but uh, I'm based not too far from there, so trust me. Uh, no, I'm in I'm in Fort Lauderdale, so oh it's, nice, uh, right, for neighbors. Yeah, so we'll yeah. get together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm looking well, forward to having one right in my backyard. You We're talking about New York. You talked about New York and the market opportunity. Like we saw firsthand Anthony walk around uh, Manhattan there. It's just, they get that cleaned up and they go from black market to legal market. It's just a massive market. I know we talk a lot about Florida right now and Pennsylvania and Ohio, but you know, could New York be the biggest cannabis market in the world one day? It could be. It absolutely could be. When you look at the population, you look at New York city, it, re it really could be. Um, it's going to be a matter of, uh, how much of the market is in the is being purchased in the regulated market because the illicit yep. market is just uh so large and has been so emboldened with the lack of enforcement uh that's been out there but if that changes i think uh you know which, which we are hopeful that we're beginning to see the seeds of that happening uh it's going to look a lot different well there's lots of interest pertaining to this industry i know we can't really tell timeline wise but rescheduling is a top of mind but man if that does happen that'll help out a lot of companies related to 280e but you know we keep saying a lot of interest how have you found so far with the tsx being listed three months in has it been positive look overall it's been positive i think um you know the fact that we've now got custody set up at uh, bank of new york mellon and state street uh you know that you know two of the largest custodians in the world uh you know that's massive the fact that we have institutions that can now uh, custody and hold uh, cure relief shares, uh, you know, is uh, the start of fixing the plumbing that uh, has been one of the reasons that the capital markets have been so held back. You know, the conversations that we're now having with institutions that, you know, stopped paying attention to cannabis uh, a while ago because they couldn't custody the shares and, and that, uh, you know, now some of that interest uh, is, uh, you know, really starting to get reinvigorated will certainly help if we get a catalyst out of DC. Um, but uh, but it's been great. I think um, it's going to take time. You know, these things don't happen uh, overnight, um, you know, but I think uh, overall it's been a big, uh, big step forward. And, uh, you know, it's a big focus of ours uh, for 2024 to continue to capitalize on that, you know, hopeful to get in some of the indices here later in the year, which I think will, uh, you know, continue to be a, uh, a big milestone as well. It's crazy what you turn grassroots into from like day one. And then what was it from day one, you opened up to the uh, date that you uh, sold 
Uh, how many years was that? It was six years about from the time that I started. Uh, you know, it, it was, I just it's been uh, hit my 10 year anniversary uh, from when I started. I uh, started with three stores in Chicago, three dispensaries, and then got vertical, uh, became grassroots uh, in Illinois. So that it was a, it's been a 10 year plus journey now. And we ended up closing with Cureleaf uh, about six years into it in July 2020. So it's and how is, is Select is speaking of the brands is Select over in, is Select a European brand um, with, uh, with with, with Cureleaf? It's going to be soon. Yeah, we're bringing it over okay. to uh, to Europe. It is so you know the European regulations on branding and on on that uh, yeah. are still in its early days because of the medical nature of uh, of that some of the restrictions that we've had but uh we are starting to bring our brands over to europe we just rebranded our clinics in the uk to, uh cure leaf that was actually really interesting uh you know the awareness of the cure leaf brand in europe even though we didn't have any cure leaf consumer facing stores or brands yeah. in the market uh you know we were it was it was really uh, amazing to see the uh the awareness of uh of this global brand and now that we have our clinics uh, branded there we're really building on that so we're bringing select over we're going to continue to bring uh hopefully grassroots and uh our yeah. full portfolio of brands and we've got some great brands in europe as well our 420 farmer brand in germany is known as the premium uh you know brand for flour in uh in germany and is one of the the few brands that's actually been gaining market share even though that german market yeah. is uh you know kind of uh gotten some oversupply here so you know we're pretty pretty excited about our portfolio that we can uh, bring there and not a single gray hair on that head either. You know, I've got them. Like that's why I keep the hair short here. So it's uh, I let it grow out like Anthony. Uh, you see a lot of gray. So yeah. <laughs> listen, appreciate you taking the time. Let's keep in touch. Hopefully, we see you next month down in Florida at the uh, Benzenga conference. But uh, look, you know, taking a step back, I know there are some people might have questions about you know over your know, year over year revenue growth. But at the end of the day, I remember there was days where we we're producing two two hundred and fifty million, and we thought. When does that day come when we reach a billion dollars? We're here. So I think we got to look at things, the grand scheme of things, and look at this as this isn't a three to five week uh, industry to be invested in. This is three to five years and it continues to grow. But uh, more importantly, on behalf of Anthony and I, we appreciate the time. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the uh, discussion. All Thank right. You. Thanks. Thanks, for the time, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Bye. That was good. Brings a lot of energy, yeah. that's for sure. But uh, yeah. I thought it was interesting just the way he broke down that European market because, uh, you know, outlining some of the numbers and what we learned a week and a half ago, uh, just about how it's going to be a lot easier for doctors to uh, prescribe medical cannabis I mean, based off of that announcement. And then you think about new companies that want to enter into that market. A, it's time consuming. And to think of ignore, what they built out. Yeah, you, you, you can't ignore the first mover advantage that they have in Europe. I, know. I mean, people say that the stock trades at a premium, the stock trades at a premium because they are well established on two continents. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they're taking the key learnings from the States. They're bringing them over to Europe. Europe is going to be a show me story, um, which they're positioned in the key markets to yeah. show us that growth. Um, it's going to be it's going to be nice to see. I'm very curious to see if any of the other MSOs um copy that strategy moving yeah. forward the only problem is it's going to be capex heavy or they're gonna to have to go out and make a big acquisition um to get into the european market but i mean one thing's for certain they've got the they've got the pole position they've got the lead um in terms of the eu yeah classify is the largest cannabis company in the world uh i know we have the headlines they, that we want to yeah we want to dive into mary meds q4 earnings as well uh, Mitch, I think I'm going to push that off till tomorrow morning. I want to dive in deep to that just because we're approaching the 40 minute mark. I really want to dive in deep to the Marymed numbers as well. We had some good conversations with their team on the analyst call, but uh, we're going to push that to tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. We'll bring in TDR's head of research, Bill McNarlin, who was in on that uh, analyst call, and we will break down the numbers pertaining to that. And uh, obviously bring in uh, some of you who are asking where Guap is today. He's in the back ground right now he's listening closely but we'll have him back on too so we'll dissect that tomorrow uh as well as dan the chart man will join us once again we'll look at some of the charts and we'll probably look at a few things related to crypto knowing we reached all-time highs with bitcoin this week as uh, the crypto industry continues to surge but in the meantime appreciate you checking in here today anthony it was good little conversation yeah, with matt as usual like i said all of his wars uh before smash that like button the more likes we get the more conversations that we can get going, leave comments, YouTube, love those algorithms. And uh, like I said, this wants to go viral. We want this to go viral. We want to build this community. So make sure you like, 
leave some comments and please subscribe to our channel because we wouldn't be here without you. Thanks for checking in everyone. And we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about the emerging industries that we cover, then leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to interview, the questions you want asked, and the information that you want to learn. We want to hear from you. As usual, click on that bell for all notifications to get the latest information. Share this video with your network and don't